Now, the static keyword is basically a modifier that we use to associate a member with the type rather than an instance of the type. So in other words, if we use the static keyword, that means that you don't have to instantiate the class in order to access that static member. If I were, therefore, to create a static method, that means that without an instance of the class, I can access that method just simply by referring to the name of the class. A good example that we've already used is the POW method of the math class. You remember using the math.pow call in order to raise a base to a power, but we never once created an instance of the math class. It's not necessary. That's because the pow method is actually defined at the class level, not the instance level. So that means that every class really is divided into two logical segments. We have our static or class level members, and then we have the non-static or instance level members. So typically, every class then refers to or contains members, which may include methods, fields, properties, etc. And to use the instance members, you have to create an instance of the class. If you have a class that has both instance and static elements in that class, you cannot call any of the instance members directly from a static method. Now this sounds a little bit odd. If I have local methods, they're both part of the same class, why wouldn't I directly be able to call one from another? Well, it makes sense if you logically think about it. If you're dealing with instance members, we're assuming that those methods are running within an instance of the class. The static members are not. Therefore, since we have two logical segments, the static methods cannot directly call into the instance methods unless going through a defined instance of the class. Instance methods, however, are free to call static methods as needed. So every instance of the class has its own data, but there is only one copy of any static data. Static members can either be methods or data members. On this line of code, I've created a static data member. This is a public static string called species. Now I've set species to the string homo sapien. The idea is that technically every person is probably going to be of the same species. Therefore, this is data that is very effectively shareable. Uh, we don't necessarily have to have a separate instance of this data for every single person because each person is basically going to be able to share the same data. If the species of the person ever changes, I could change it once here, and everybody that uses the person class would be able to see the change. Of course, understand that the string species is only available by going through the person class explicitly, not through the instance, p, as an example. I've also created a method here, a static string. The method name is ConvertGender. And what I'm doing is allowing the user to pass in a character, which I'm calling GenderVal. And then based on that character, I'm going to return a string. So if they enter an uppercase or a lowercase f, then I'll return the string female. If they, respend, if they send in an uppercase or a lowercase m, I'll return the string male. Otherwise, my default is unknown if no valid value has been passed in. Now remember that in this switch, we talked about this before, that we do have a rule that says that you have to put a break at the end of every case. Remember that that only qualifies when the case is empty. Or when the case is not empty, excuse me. So in this particular case, the case for capital F is empty, therefore it's allowed to fall in to the lowercase f case, and I can provide one return value for both of those cases. That makes it quite a bit more convenient. Well, let's go back to our other class and see how these elements can be called. What I've done in this example is I have created an instance of the person class but if I'm accessing static elements, I don't need the instance. In this right line statement, you'll notice that what I'm writing is the string that's returned by person.convertgender, and I'm passing in the capital F. Since convertgender is a static member, I don't access it through the variable p. I'm accessing that using the name of the class, person. Again, very similar to the POW method of the math class. In fact, I could even eliminate this instantiation statement and it would work just as well. 
the instance is not actually needed if I'm accessing a static member. Let's execute this and look at our results. Well, it seems like we're getting the results that we would expect. Passing in the value of the capital F returns the converted gender to us as a string. So in this example, we can see how we interact with static data elements as well as static members and hopefully see the difference between managing static versus instance data and static versus instance methods. A reference type variable therefore stores a reference to an instance of an object rather than any actual data itself. Technically, all non-static object members, whether those be fields or methods, are available through this reference. And these objects are stored on the heap, not on the stack. We've also seen the basic instantiation, but look at the example at the bottom of the slide. Here again, we've got a variable p defined as type person. So to create an instance of the person class, person p equals new person, that's my instantiation statement. Then any public methods or accessible methods, in this case maybe a method or a field called name, allows, I'm allowed to make a change to that element by going through that object variable or reference variable p. A single object on the heap can actually have more than one reference. And this is sort of interesting because what that means is that you could have different reference variables at different points in the application that all point to the same physical object. Therefore, if you were to manipulate the fields or the properties or call the methods of the object through one reference, then when you were to look at those values from another reference, you would see those modifications. So any change that's made to the instance will actually be visible by all other references. Take a look at the example here. In this case, we're creating a reference variable called p1, and we're doing an actual instantiation at this point. p1 equals new person. Then I create another reference variable, p2. p2 is assigned to the same reference as p1. So technically now, p1 is equal to p2, or in other words, those two references point to the same physical object. Now, if I were to change the name by going through p2, p2.name equals Steve, and then I were to change the name of p1, p1.name equals Mike, what's the result? In this case, p2.name would be equal to Mike. That's because the change that was made through p1 changed the data that was stored in the same reference or the same object that p2 is referencing as well. So anything that you do through any of these references is actually going to be visible through the other references. This can happen quite frequently, especially when you start passing in uh, reference variable types as parameters and methods. In that case, you're actually passing in the references into the method. You may have two physical references that point to the same object, what you do inside your method, how you view it outside the method. Now, they can all really impact each other. So one of the important things to remember to do is when you're finished with your references, you need to put those away. You need to destroy those. In this example, I've taken the reference P2, and I've destroyed that reference by setting P2 equal to null. P2 equals null disassociates the reference variable P2 with the actual object. That means that P2 is no longer a live reference. This would be a null reference. P1 may still be active, and the object may still be loaded. However, as soon as the P1 reference is discontinued as well, the object no longer has any references that point to it. It would be available for garbage collection.